everyone. Welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's community talk show. I'm Wendy O'Connell. We have someone from the community coming on today to talk to us about various things, and that is Simone Renault. Simone's roots are in Brittany, France, where he grew up and where his family has lived for generations. He came to America to study permaculture and eventually landed in the Brattleboro area, where he ran Sunhill Farm for about 10 years. He got his master's from Marlboro College, and in 2020, he became the general manager of the Scott Farm on Kipling Road, where he and his dynamic team focus on the intrinsic connections between people, history, agriculture, and community. Welcome, Simone. Thank you. Great to have you on the show. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you here. Um, you know, talking about your family and going back generations, mm -hmm. um, farming and orcharding as well, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, I always like to ask people about certain influences in their life, and I know that you had a, a little um, sort of epiphany um, at some point when you were younger, uh, thinking about your connection to the land, I believe. Yeah, um, well, I need a little bit of context. I mean, the greater context, I grew up with two grandparents, a set of grandparents on both sides who were farmers, you know, who were born in the 19 teens and 20s. and. Uh, grew up relatively poor, grew up on the French, in the French countryside. And, and then the next generation, the generation of my parents, was that baby boomer generation that, uh, I mean, their parents really wanted them to get out of the farm, to, yeah. do, you know, to go all the way to high school, mm -hmm. to uh, maybe you know, um, get some studies. My mom became a nurse, my dad became an accountant, kind of mm -hmm. the classic, made it to the middle class. And then I'm that generation that came after, and I feel like I had, I think, in my mid-teens, um, you know, I did what I was told to do. I was a good boy. I studied in school. I played sports, and I had. We would ev just about every weekend we'll go go back to the farms. But I, I, I didn't have any practical connection to farming, mm. to mm -hmm. the farm, to you know, having that that very practical connection to, to making a living, right? Yeah. And um, I think the story you're referring to that, that you know is that I, uh, maybe age 16, my mom asked me to light a fire and, uh, and I couldn't light a fire. Mm. I just had no idea how to light a fire. And I was, yeah, I think 15, 16. And I felt, honestly, in the moment, I felt a deep sense of shame. I'm like, who is this? You know, I felt underdeveloped. I felt inadequate in that moment huh. of just like, oh my God, I'm like this 16 year old who can't light a fire. Yeah. This is weird. And, and that, I think psychologically, it set me on a path to try to rebalance a little bit, yes. maybe more in the body, more in learning practical skills. Mm -hmm. uh, it took, you know, it took many years. I still, you know, I graduated, I, I went to college. Um, and college was hard, and and then as soon as I could leave college, I just um, I went off and learned about farming and self-sufficiency. And that's when you were still in France. Still in France, but pretty soon started traveling. I, oh. I you know, in my late teens, early twenties, I feel like I, I caught the farming bug, and at the same time, caught caught the traveling bug uh -huh. and woofing. You know, um, for those who don't know, it's a network that connects young people or people of all ages who want to learn about farming, who want to you know, experience life on farms, on organic farms, and farms around the world who welcome oh. volunteers. Mm -hmm. And so I discovered this network and that led me to volunteer all over Europe and then ah. I traveled beyond overseas. And so did it really get in your blood? working on the land? It, I think it really did. I, in a very subconscious way, yeah. I think I started something was just right yeah. about getting my hands dirty. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And it set something in motion. It set something in motion. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, felt, I felt more at peace when I was, uh, when I was outside running mm -hmm. after animals than, than I did at a desk. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so, so that worked. Yeah, that's so interesting. So you decided, but you decided to come to America. What was it that propelled you in that direction? So I ended up living in Ireland for three years. I worked on farms there in Ireland, and I discovered permaculture uh, there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I was really interested in self-sufficiency and, and skills of building, skills of organic farming. And, uh, and I did some workshops. Some, I discovered permaculture in Ireland doing workshops with people who had come from America, oh, who uh -huh. would come to Europe once a year and give work, permaculture workshop. And these people had a permaculture school in Oregon. Oh. 
and uh, and at some point they invited me to come and do an internship uh -huh. and uh, for a year in Oregon and that's what brought me over. Mm -hmm. And so how did you end up in Brattleboro or the Brattleboro that area? That is also a long story and I don't <laughs> know that I have the short version but I'm going to give it a try. Um, in that school of permaculture in Oregon I met Dana uh, who later became my wife yes. and is the love of my life. And uh, Dana grew up on the East Coast. Dana was living out West at the time and had for a few years. Mm -hmm. and, but Dana grew up on the East Coast and her family is here. And I think when we decided to have a family together, um, the East Coast felt like a good, yeah. a, a good location for yeah. us. And, and quickly that led us to Vermont. Dana had some ties to Vermont. Mm -hmm. and, oh, um, um, that'll and do it. We visited some friends of hers who, you know, her brother had gone to Marlboro. She had some friends who had gone to SIT. Mm -hmm. She had some friends living here. We stayed with her friends. There were many connections mm -hmm. that, that led us to this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so you end up um, actually in Putney. Uh, mm -hmm. where um, you did farming, mostly vegetable farming, but you yeah. also had sheep at that time. That's I also remember that there you had a llama who would I watch the sheep. Betty. Who was the guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had, um, I had several llamas, but Betty was one of them. I yeah. remember her, yeah. yeah. And yeah, you would, yeah. You would Guarding see, the sheep. It was wonderful. You would see like this hillside of sheep and this llama who was alert. Watchful. Yes, very, yeah. very watchful. Yeah. It was really sweet. Um, does Vermont feel like home to you now? In many ways it does. Yeah. Uh, that's where my children were born. Yeah, that's right. where we got married. Um, I've been here for 16 years now. I think home deep down is, is, is always back in France, back mm -hmm. in Brittany. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel certainly adopted by Vermont. Yeah. And I feel, uh, yeah, in many ways I feel at home here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My wife points that out, Dana, when we go back to France, she said before, like, she can feel me relax. Uh, like my whole body. Yes, there's right. some, there's a certain like sinking, yeah. anything that's that connection, yeah, to yeah, yeah. a terroir, to connection to a piece of land. Settling yeah. into, yes. <coughs> um, and so at some point, um, it, you're still at Sun Hill, but you decide to go back for a master's. What, what was the impetus for that? Um, so that time at Sun Hill Farm, yeah, I had sheep. I had a small vegetable, uh, vegetable farm CSA. I also worked closely with John Burt. Yes. Uh, John Burt, who's the owner of Sun Hill Farm. Yes. Worked closely with John Burt, with Ruthie, who yes. lives there, who became, you know, sort of, there's family and there's, there's just that outer layer. They became like yes. a, a family of choice. Yes. Uh, still uh, feel very close to them and love them. Yep. And, um, I mean, to be frank, what triggered going to Marlboro was a desire to expand a little bit, yeah. a desire to still keeping in mind, still wanting to be in the food system, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, wanting to expand professionally, wanting to mm -hmm. expand financially mm -hmm. uh, also. And then I discovered this program at Marlboro that was a, a master's in management of mission-driven organization. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was just the right fit. Mm -hmm. and, um, it took two and a half years. It was a hybrid program. Yeah. And I feel very, very fortunate to mm -hmm. have been able to go there. Mm -hmm. You gave a little talk when you graduated um, to the uh, graduating class, you mm -hmm. know, an That's inspirational right. talk. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that I love that you said is um, uh, for people going out into the world to follow the clues, to fall in love with the unknown. Yeah, that's not for me. That's that's a that's a quote from um, a man I interviewed actually during my capstone at, at Marlboro, Sparrow Sparrow Hart, uh -huh. who's a, a wise man from the Putney Mountains. Yeah, um, yeah, who talks a lot about uh, you know talks about our relationship with the unknown, mm -hmm. um, and there's something very alive about that. Mm -hmm. I think we are. You know, I think our mind loves to know what's going to happen. The truth is we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we love to ruminate on what happened. The truth is our memory of the past is most often very flawed, right? Mm. And I think Sparrow talks about falling in love with the unknown, which really means being very present. Yeah. It's just like, it's just being super alert and curious yeah. as much as we can. So. And trusting too. I think, I think trust comes into that. Yeah, you know? that's interesting. Yeah, 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 for sure. Trusting in mm -hmm. oneself, trusting you know that um, that if you're following your heart, or whatever it is that you really love, mm -hmm. that you know every. I think that we worry so much about how things are going to turn out. I do. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> is that apple pie going to set up? Is that <laughs> crepe going to turn over okay? And that kind of thing. Yeah. I was going to say recently, but actually it's been a few years, since 2020. Four that, years, yeah. Four years that you've mm -hmm. been at Scott Farm. Mm -hmm. Of course, those were um, an interesting bunch of years. Scott Farm is sort of the for-profit farm, mm. a property of, of the Landmark Trust USA. The Landmark Trust is a nonprofit, is a historic preservation nonprofit, mm -hmm. and they uh, steward really historic properties, uh, the flagship being Nolaka, the Kipling house. Yes. You know, Roger Kipling built a house here in the 1890s. Yep. And the, the Landmark Trust does a, just a fantastic job maintaining those properties with a business model of opening them to the public for overnight stays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's five properties around Scott Farm. There's one in Whitingham. There's, you know, a potential plans for expansion, even out of state. And uh, it's very unique to be able to stay in those, I know because I've done it, I even invited family, and to be able to stay in those historic properties yeah. and to experience history that way mm -hmm. is, is really fantastic. I would really recommend to folks to go on the Scott Farm website because it's a very clear website it, mm. it, and there's so much information on it. I mean, this is, the, um, this is where the Stone Trust Center is, which is the largest display of dry, dry stone walls in, the nor in North America and the only indoor dry stone walling education and training center in the world. So that's mm. happening at Scott Farm. You know, the event center, as you mentioned, there are mm. workshops that go on there. Um, crepe night, mm -hmm. as, which you are leading. Really, you're the main guy for crepe night, right? Yeah, yeah you're yeah. making the crepes. And then you've got a cafe and a market And we've got there. a cafe now, yeah, and our market is open seasonally, really yeah. during harvest. Mm -hmm. So we generally open our market and now the cafe in August mm -hmm. and stay open until Thanksgiving, serving sandwich, sandwiches and, and lunches and, yeah. and offering flights of hard cider. And it's, That's it's, a cool idea. Yeah, and it's a, it's a good way for people to not only come and visit Scott Farm, but also make it a destination yes. and invite people to come and, and stay. I mean, it, as you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful it's a, place. It's, it's one um, of the most beautiful roads. And we've got a <coughs> heck of a lot of beautiful roads in the area. That's right. Beautiful road, Nalaka is right there. Yep. The uh, views are incredible. So Scott Farm, uh, you know, is a business. So I'm the general manager of the business. And our business primarily is to uh, grow fruit uh, for profit as much as we can. And yet, I think partly being owned by a nonprofit, we're very community oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, so we host a lot of events. You've mentioned crepe nights before. Um, you know, we host weddings, we have an event room. And Scott Farm itself, yes, is an heirloom, dates back to 1791. The Holbrook family that owned the orchard in the 1900s, 1911 planted 80 acres, mm -hmm. the commercial orchard the way we know it today. Mm -hmm. And in the early 2000s, after the Scott Farm was donated uh, by the Holbrooks, um, uh, the, the, the orchard was slowly converted from a primarily commodity orchard to a collection, a mosaic of, of heirloom varieties. Mm. And today, in the orchard on about, you know, a little under 20 acres, we have about 140 different varieties wow. of apples. Wow. And we also grow, you know, we have 12 different varieties of plums. We grow peaches, yes. blueberries, quince, medlars. A lot of different mm -hmm. pears, of course. A um, mm -hmm. lot of lot of different fruit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is that unusual, Simone? Do other farms have that kind of variety? Other orchards? No, I think it's very rare. I mean, certainly for a commercial orchard, mm -hmm. I don't know of any other commercial orchard yeah, right. that has such a wide variety mm -hmm. of of um, a wide blend, a wide collection. Mm -hmm. of, uh, there are other orchards and more like collection, nonprofit orchards, yeah. uh, museum orchards that mm -hmm. really try to have a, um, you know, the Maine Heritage Orchard is an example that comes to mind in Unity, Unity Maine, uh -huh. uh, affiliated with FETCO. They do a fantastic tree. John Bunker is one of the sort of grandfather of mm -hmm. the revival of heirlooms in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so, but as a commercial orchard, uh, it's it's quite unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, even though this was an anomaly, I think it's worth mentioning this year of uh, 2023 mm -hmm. and how the weather affected the crops. Yeah, and we had a fairly early bloom, and then we were at the very tail end of bloom, uh, what we call petal fall, when we had on May 18th last year, when we had a night when the temperatures dropped to 23, 25 degrees. 
And the, the little apples that were starting to grow that were about, you know, marble size, yeah. uh, froze, yeah. froze solid. And yeah. that uh, just um, killed 90 plus percent mm. of our crop. Mm. Yeah, and it was devastating in terms of in terms of our business. Yes, uh, it, it is. We're feel we're feeling it right now. Here we are. March yeah. is when we've ran out of money. We're having to borrow yeah. money, yeah. and we're having to survive until the next crop, which won't come until September 2024. Right. And you, as general manager, probably <coughs> had to do a lot of uh, fancy footwork to get uh, some support. Yeah, during that time. we. Uh, I think one of the things we did that we can get a lot of credit for in terms of our staff was to, you know, it took it took a couple of weeks to find our footing, yeah, you know, that. under the, the shock and realization of what happened. Mm -hmm. And I work very closely, you know, my work is, is, is very much in the office. Uh, and I work very closely with Aaron Robinson, our orchardist, who, who's the boots on the ground, who's, you know, who's a woman who does a fantastic job out in the orchard. and. I want to say, I think she may have known right away, but I, speaking for myself, it took me a week or two to fully fathom what had happened. Yeah, yeah. And, but I want to give credit to, to our staff who, you know, quickly after that, managed to remain positive and reached out and just wanted to put the word out. You know, mm -hmm. we could have chosen to close our doors, to not hire all of our seasonal staff and yeah. to say, let's buckle down. Uh -huh. uh, but we did the opposite, which is we started reaching out. We started a GoFundMe campaign. We, uh, um, we put together an event, uh, Orchard Aid, yes. uh, that, you know, gathered the five local orchards and really, you know, Musicians volunteer their time. It was at the Retreat Farm. It Such just a offered their venue. It was a fun, was so fun event, yeah. um, and and we made some noise, like in in yeah. you know local papers, and and we started, you know, started a conversation with local representatives who have been yeah. since then very supportive. Mm -hmm. Are currently, I think, of Mike Mariki, currently working on uh, including a bill in the next budget, yeah. uh, a relief bill for Vermont orchards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in many ways our approach paid off. We, we you know, we had people come to the farm. Yeah. Uh, a funny thing that happened is that we still had a few apples. They were misshaped. They yeah. were misshapen. They were, you know, sometimes damaged. We were able to make cider, and we were able mm -hmm. to sell, you know, some apples mm -hmm. out of our store. Mm -hmm. And people responded well, mm -hmm. really well. Mm -hmm. We got so much support, and I. Uh, I want to say it gave, it gave a whole new dimension to our work. Yes, and to the uh, community that you, you've created and mm -hmm. that also that you're a part of. Yeah. You mentioned cider. In France, um, yeah, we have different terms for sweet cider and hard cider. And yeah. Here in this country, when you say cider, you never really know if it's oh. the sweet or the alcoholic stuff. Yeah. Um, but at Scott Farm, I want to acknowledge the sweet cider. Uh, we have so many varieties to, to play with, and I think many people in this community will acknowledge that Scott Farm cider is really unique. Uh -huh. We don't pasteurize it, we put it in glass bottles, mm -hmm. we press it regularly so mm -hmm. it's always fresh. Um, and the blends we're able to make with all the varieties, Aaron, our orchard is, is, is super knowledgeable, has, has great uh, taste for that to create these blends. Mm -hmm. um, so sweet cider is wonderful, certainly at Scott Farm. Yes. And then there's the hard cider. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, uh, uh, well, I have some family heritage with hard cider. So Brittany and Normandy in France are the sort of the apple and the cider regions of France. And I grew up in a family that had a small cider orchard, mm -hmm. uh, an orchard primarily dedicated to hard cider, uh, did not make it on a commercial, at a commercial scale, mm -hmm. but made significant amounts uh, for the family and the neighbors. And so I grew up, uh, you know, hearing conversations about which blend of apples are we using this year, and the apples, you know, the juice yeah. then makes it to the oak barrels, and when is it time to bottle, yeah. or when do we need to stop? You know, always every year a oh, different conversation oh. about so you got osm the this specialties. Os osmosis a lot. Yeah, by osmosis, but it took a while because when I landed here, uh, even before Scott Farman started to make hard cider by myself, uh, you know, for many years it tasted awful. And ah. it took a long time. Ah. <laughs> yeah, like I, I realized I had no idea, really. You know, I'd witnessed. I'd spent my childhood witnessing, you yes. know, and helping out. 
but to make hard cider by oneself and then to step up in making it at a commercial scale, like at Scott Farm, it, yes. it's, it's, uh, it definitely took some experimenting and, but and a lot of learning. But you're doing it, and, and you're really producing also Yeah, as and well. now, you know, three years ago, we, we became licensed as a manufacturer of hard cider by mm -hmm. the state of Vermont and, mm -hmm. and then at the federal level. And uh, mm -hmm. for the last three years, we've been, you know, making, yeah, at a commercial scale, we've been, last year we bottled, you know, 3,500 bottles, which is, you know, in, in terms of a commercial cidery, it's still very tiny. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it's still a good amount. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's artisanal as well, It's right? artisanal. And, and my, you know, my quest, my holy grail is to try to, is to, try to make a hard cider like the hard cider I grew up with. Ah. I, I have, you know... I, if I did not know how to make hard cider, and, and that has been taking, that has been an apprenticeship, uh, I know what good cider tastes like. Ah, uh, and you have that meant, well, you go back as mm -hmm. well. I go back and ask back. a lot of questions. And yeah. <laughs> my grandmother, my, my dad. Um, and is it true that your grandmother doesn't drink water? She only drinks cider? Yeah, she's about to turn 102, and, <laughs> and now the doctors have said, it's about time you start drinking water. So what is true is that for a long time, she did not drink water, but I, it's not a unique case. It's funny. I grew up thinking that Mimi had a little bit of a problem <laughs> with alcohol, but it, it took me a while to realize that she's part of that generation, and I actually think it was true in this country as well. Mm. That people grew up on, you know, people grew up on farms, mm -hmm. and water was not always safe to drink. Yes, that's right. Hard cider, and actually apples that would be pressed, that yeah. would be fermented into juice, mm -hmm. that then were put in barrels and were uh, a beverage yes. and were calories and nutrients that were available yeah. throughout the year was the safest drink. And it was their beverage. And it was their beverage. Yes, yes. So, and they worked a lot. And your grandmother's going to be 102. So and my <laughs> grandmother, that's, you know, that's kind of my sales pitch with the hard cider that <laughs> I make. Because like, listen, there's... There's no secret anymore. Oh, this is the elixir of life. That's, that's yeah. really fabulous. So as you've been working with, um, with creating ciders, have you noticed, um, do, do you feel like you have a nose, like a parfumier has a nose, and, and a palate, of course, in this case, too? Yeah, I'm pretty picky. Um, and, and some ciders we make I'm not mm, super happy with, mm -hmm. and, and I try to improve on it. And some, like last year's, we had some very good hard ciders. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely an art in, in yeah. being able to, you know, during the fermentation process, yeah. um, uh, know what what to do and when to do it. Yeah, and that discernment. Timing is really important. I mean, it starts with the apples also. I think there's yeah, a lot of credit right. that needs to go back to the people who grow the apples. Right. Uh, you know, our orchardist in this case, and having good apples. I think yeah. that's often what people, uh, what's uh, known, uh, often misunderstood or, or not not known about good hard cider. Uh, I think. You know, you don't make wine with table grapes. They're very specific mm -hmm. variety mm -hmm. varieties uh, that that wine is made with. It's the same with hard cider. Mm -hmm. They're very specific varieties of apples that are used to make a good hard cider. Mm -hmm. You don't make hard cider with Macintosh. I mean, in my book, uh -huh. yep. there's a whole panel of discussion <laughs> right there. Um, so it goes, you know, it goes to the apples themselves yes. and and choosing the right apples, uh, choosing the right blends. Yeah. of apples and then you know and then playing with that wild fermentation right and are you finding that the um, heirloom apples are a, a sort of a, a different mix altogether in with the hard ciders yeah well there are specific varieties heirloom mm -hmm. varieties mm -hmm. for hard cider mm -hmm. uh, and some have come from Britain uh, some have come from France mm -hmm. some you know have been you know discovered uh, and developed in this country mm -hmm. uh, but very often it has to do with tannins. Uh, with what? Tannins. Tannins, yes. Yeah, right. good apple varieties for hard cider have a higher level of tannin. Uh -huh. And uh, tannins somehow, you know, the human palate, when we eat it, it's yeah. astringent. Yeah. We don't necessarily like it. Yeah. But in a beverage, uh, they're actually, I just read something recently, you know, when we drink it, those tannins help slow down the liquid in the mouth oh, interesting. and and hangs on to some of those taste buds ah. and and if you you know a drink that doesn't have any tannins will 
will go down uh -huh. uh, much faster. But the tannins really slow down those flavors and help you experience a, a much broader palate. That's fascinating. You mentioned crepe nights. Uh, I, I like to make crepes. Uh, crepes, you know, originally, we claim, come from Brittany yep. and, and um, the sweet crepes, but also the savory crepes. Mm -hmm. In Brittany, we, people traditionally grew a lot of buckwheat. My parents, my grandparents grew buckwheat and, and buckwheat doesn't have gluten. You can't make bread with it. And people would make these uh. big, large, flat buckwheat cakes um, that then would be filled with whatever was available on the farm. Mm -hmm. I mean, eggs very often, maybe a little bit of bacon. And so I love eating them, I love making them, I make them for my family. I made them at the farmer's market for a little while in uh -huh. Brattleboro. And uh, when I came to Scott Farm, uh, yeah, I started you know, doing those, those crepe nights. And the model of the crepe nights was really modeled after um, Orchard Hill, the, the Breadworks. Yes. And their pizza nights. Yes, Noah Elbers, yes. Noah, who uh, is a friend and, and a wonderful guy who started these pizza nights uh, where they sponsor uh, or you know, co-host with yes. a local nonprofit and, mm -hmm. and, and the benefits from the night go to that local nonprofit. So we try to mimic that model at Scott Farm. Yeah. Can't do it every week like Noah does at, at Orchard Hill. Uh, monthly crepe nights, the first one will be in May. I think it's May 15th, mm -hmm. second Wednesday. Um, and, uh, and there will be five this year, uh, five monthly, yeah. monthly crepe nights yeah. with different organizations. Yeah, I so, highly recommend them. They are so yeah. much fun. They're so much fun because <laughs> yeah, it's are. a community event for one thing, yeah. and you do a savory and sweet. You get a full meal. Yeah, you know. You do. Um, and they're so and, delicious. And the money and the money goes to a good cause. Yeah. Um, so it's a great way to get together. Yeah. The hard cider is a similar story. It's just, you know, it's bringing a little piece of me, a little piece of my heritage yes. to Scott Farm, to this area. So it was true with the crepes and it's true with the hard cider. And over time, of course, I, I miss, I love where I come from. Yeah. And I often talk about it so much, you know, Brittany and this yeah. and that and France, that over the years people have said, someday you have to bring us there. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't think I would have ever made it, actually made it happen without uh, Bob Lawson and Cicely Carroll mm -hmm. from uh, Travel Fever Tours. Yeah. And they sort of gave me a nudge and said, we'll help out, let's make it happen. So thanks to Bob and Cicely and Travel Fever, in April we are bringing uh, 13 people from the area uh, to Brittany for, for a week on a farm to table tour yeah. where we'll visit growers, uh, visit a cider maker, uh, visit oyster be old ancestral oyster beds, and you know, eat some good food. It sounds like so much fun. It'll be really and fun. so delicious, because you're going to be It'll eating. It'll be delicious and fun. You're going to be eating well the whole yeah, time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing, um, one other thing, I know that you're, uh, you're involved with, you do some biking, um, you play some soccer, you coach some basketball, so you're in the community. You know everything. <laughs> I know everything about you. <laughs> I know, it's scary. <laughs> and um, I know that you've got a couple kids that are still in school, so mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's where coaching is coming from, too. One of the things that you mentioned earlier that was uh, wonderful for me to learn is the connection between heirloom, heritage, and inheriting. I think that's really what's unique about about heirloom apples, they're really inherited from the past, mm -hmm. right? There are some commodity apples, the Honeycrisps and you know the yeah. the Gala and and the Cortland that yeah. that were developed, you know, by by universities by programs. Mm -hmm. But the characteristic of heirlooms and what's wonderful is that they always come with stories, stories yeah, of people, right. uh, and those those varieties were you know are inherited and were passed on yes. from generations to generations, yeah. a little bit like like the family heirlooms. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. And they are, mm -hmm. they are our family heirlooms. They are yeah. our family heirlooms. And yes. that's, um, that's one of the things that, is, that I love and I feel privileged to be at Scott Farm is thanks to all those heirlooms, we have people coming to us with so many stories. Oh, great. Yeah. You know, yeah. I grew up with that apple. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. my mom made applesauce yes. with this very specific yellow transparent apples. Yes. Or, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin and Wolf River was our apple of choice. <laughs> or right, right, right. I'm from Britain and I will never make a pie with anything else but Bramley seedling. You yeah. know, it's it's quite it's quite wonderful to to experience it that is and wonderful. To hear and all those stories. Yes, and as you say, all of this, all these things that you are doing is just kind of a great way to gather people together. And I think that's the 
that's the common thread is connection yeah. is 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 we all eat right and not to get into politics but you know I grew up in a family that had a very wide spectrum of political belief mm -hmm. and um, everybody got along uh, because I think food was a big part of it yeah, yeah. was that we all love good food they yeah. all you know and and so it's one of the things we have in common, you know, and finding common ground is so important Especially these days. Especially when it's right? delicious. <laughs> so good food, there's no better way to find common ground than, than good food. Yeah. Simone, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. This is a delight. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for joining us today for this very delicious show. Um, Tune in again. We will be back. And uh, as I mentioned, check out the Scott Farm website because there are so many things going on there and Simone is a part of so many of them. Um, so stay tuned. We will be back and we appreciate you tuning in.